Okay, let's begin lecture. We have a new TA, a grad student TA. Uh, and she is a student from Nepal. Her name is Nisha. You won't see her in this lecture, but you'll see her uh, comments helping you in web courses. Uh, and possibly at the final, you may see her. So, um, and I'm still trying to get Miss Darian back in, in, in uh, on the job. So hopefully we'll get that done in the next week or two. Last time we talked about this idea of energy as a uh, exchange quantity, a dynamical exchange quantity um, that becomes visible when you partition a free fall trajectory straight down uh, the y-axis uh, in equal increments of distance. Now the dynamical quantity uh, that we've called momentum is visible and comes out when you do a different partition of the same trajectory in equal time increments, i.e. stroboscopically. If you use a strobe photo, um, you can see the, uh, the partitions of equal seconds or equal time increments. Uh, but with a meter stick is all you need to do for the spatial partition. And we saw, we saw that um, Energy comes in equal bite-sized pieces uh, on the way down um, for uh, the spatial partition. Um, and just to reinforce, the metric unit of energy is the joule. Uh, it, is, it has the same units as uh, mass times the square of a speed. So it's a kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. And so that's known as a joule. It has its own name, unlike momentum, which is just kilogram meters per second. Uh, it is also equivalent to a Newton meter. Now go ahead and jot that down in your notes. It is sometimes useful to have a Newton meter uh, in your calculation instead of kilogram meters squared per second squared or, or instead of... Uh, Joule, simply because sometimes you want to cancel meters or you want to cancel a force in newtons. And if your energy is in newton meters, um, it's easy to cancel. So you like to do that. Uh, I want to make room for another uh, concept that partners up with this, and that is the concept of symmetry. So this is a little bit of new information. And what we found is that um, corresponding to these partitions, uh, momentum and energy, we found that um, if you um, take the equations of motion for energy and momentum uh, and you make a shift to the left or to the right, uh, then you have a conserved quantity automatically called momentum, spatial momentum. If you do a similar shift in the equations of motion uh, forward in time or back in time and the equations of motion don't change, the energy momentum equations of motion don't change, then you can say, yeah, energy is conserved. So one of the uh, most profound theorems in all of physics uh, is enunciated here, and that is called the Noether theorem. Let me spell it for you. It's spelled N-O-E-T-H-E-R, Noether. And it was found and discovered uh, about, I'd say, maybe 80 years ago or so by a woman named Emma Noether, N-O-E-T-H-E-R, from Germany, a uh, very smart uh, physicist, and she was one of the many Germans that escaped um, in the 1930s when Hitler came to power. She came to the United States, um, and Einstein came to the United States, a bunch of people came to the United States, and... Uh, and found refuge here and she got a job in Philadelphia I believe at Bryn Mawr College and but she was very very famous for this theorem which stays 
which states that if your equations of motion don't change when you change um, to the left or to the right or forward in time or back in time you have a conserved quantity and if you so that's so one way of uh, physically thinking of that is uh, the boxcar problem when we had the boxcars hooking up on the frictionless railroad um, track there were no external forces unbalanced and we were you would be able to say that if you if you take those that system and move it up the track by a hundred meters or a hundred millimeters or by one millimeter or da back down the track back backwards on the track by any distance you won't find any change in the equations of motion the physics won't change when that's true you have conserved momentum it's a little harder to picture what it means to transport forward in time but in the equations of motion think about this um, here's one of our simpler equations of motion uh, 1 half gt squared right? now if you go forward in time that's like saying um, add one second to every time measurement that you've got so that's like ha having 1 half g times t plus 1 quantity squared and that will change things I mean because t plus 1 quantity squared when you square it out you get first outer inner last remember that from high school um, and so that definitely changes the equations of motion um, so this is a pretty uh, important concept the idea that symmetries and conserved quantities are connected and it's called the Noether theorem and it's something that physicists make use of as often as they can and I've made use of it myself matter of fact uh, one time when I was in grad school my instructor um, uh, had to go to a conference and so he asked me and I'm a student right and so he asked me to teach the class and I and, and he said can you teach him on Noether's theorem which I had made a study of and and in order to give it in a, se a seminar about uh, as a grad student and so he said yeah I, I'm going to this conference I want you to teach the so I was teaching my own class about this particular theorem so it has a lot of meaning to me anyways let's keep going we were talking about this idea of exchanging momentum and the idea of exchanging energies I want to talk about that today so for instance the boxcars you know they exchange equal but opposite momenta ie impulses uh, when they interact you know when those two uh, sets of boxcars latch together there's a uh, leftward acceleration on boxcar number one so it slows down there's a rightward acceleration on the set of three boxcars so they start moving okay so there's an exchange of momenta and those exchange momenta exchanges are equal so it's logical to, logical to ask okay if that's the way things work for momenta um, what about energy exchanges so that's our main topic for today what is it you know you know how does the accounting change dynamically you know what is the set of dynamic quantities how do they change when you think of energy being exchanged Right? And the way that we're going to get to that is by doing some clicker questions about the basketball example. So get your clickers and your calculators ready. Get your brains ready. And uh, what we're going to do is work out some of the... Um, energy related specs for this basketball and the first one that we're going to do is the weight force and we've done this a ton of times so hopefully this is like uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, hopefully it's like uh, automatic pilot for you now we're also going to calculate the work uh, done by gravity through one of these increments okay now there was some 
four homework problems. And number four was basically this one. So if you got trip up, tripped up on number four, you can uh, you know, derive a little bit more instruction uh, through going through these questions today. We're going to figure out the corresponding change in the kinetic energy. And then when, once we've done that, we're going to think it all over. And we're going to go from those basic specs and try to extend our horizons. We're going to try to think, you know, think around the corner or as they say outside of the box we're going to try to think some new thoughts see if there's any new horizon a new mountain a new set of mountains a new mountain range to climb so question number one turn on your clickers we use frequency BB hold your power button down and then get the flashing square type in BB and you'll be on the session um, here's question one what is the weight force of a 0 0.620 kilogram basketball? Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, 173 answers. Good. Uh, and, yeah, you guys did pretty good. 97% got 6.076 uh, for the answer. Uh, make sure you make a note of that. In fact, it's in the diagram for my next question. Uh, make a note of it as a negative 6.076 to denote downward. And then answer this question. For the falling basketball, is delta y parallel or anti-parallel to the wave force? Now, parallel means the same direction. Anti-parallel means opposite directions. Okay, so if you have two vectors and they both point north, then they're parallel. If you have two vectors, one points east and one points west, they're anti-parallel. So let me start this question. Oh boy. Hold on a second. Okay. You should be able to answer now. You can if you want. B. Well, hit refresh. Got it? Okay. 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, one seventy two. And yeah, you guys got it. So for those of you that that missed it, yeah, the vocabulary term is if two vectors point in the same direction, they are parallel. If two vectors point in exactly opposite directions, they are anti-parallel. All right, so make a note of that for your vocab. Now, um, what we're doing here, if you haven't figured out, we're, we're trying to figure out energy and stuff, and we're going step by step making decisions. This is a decision, you know, knowing whether something's parallel or not. Um, and because, you know, when you're doing energy, 
if your force is working with the, 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 the velocity, you speed up. If it's working anti-parallel, you slow down. So that's a big factor. All right. Now, next question. What formula do you use? Look at those formulas very carefully. seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys did. Good. Uh, so let me ask you a question. What's this formula? Option A. I mean, that's a, that's a real formula, or part of a real formula. What does that one... Raise your hand if you spot it. If you're, what, do you, what do you see? It's part of F equals MA, i.e. Newton's second law. Yeah, that's a, this is another version of F, F equals MA. Good. Uh, what about this one, F centripetal times delta Y? You recognize that for a, a formula? Hopefully not. That's not part of any formula I ever saw. That's, that's me putting in some false questions. You remember, a multiple choice, I have to put a correct answer in. And then I have to put in some false, you know, either three or four false answers. And at least one of them has to be tempting. So, uh, and hopefully this one was not tempting. Uh, hardly anybody chose it. Uh, what about this option C? Uh, MV squared over R. Uh, Caroline. Yeah, that's the uh, centripetal force formula, okay? And then here's the last one. This is the correct answer, D. 85% uh, of you did select that. Ooh, somebody selected E. I should put a minus one for that. Uh, anyways, there is no option E. Every 85% oh, of you chose this. And just to reinforce, it's F parallel. It's the component of the force that's parallel to the velocity or parallel to the path. In free fall, it's right along the path if it's just dropping, dropping straight down. Okay, so let's keep going. We got a ton of clicker questions here. So uh, matter of fact, hit your refresh key. As I always like to say, and you know when we hit the refresh key, it means we're switching from multiple choice, in this case, to something else. We're switching to a calculation. Here it is. Uh, number four for today. Uh, calculate the work done. All right. You've got the basic specs figured out. Hey, uh, is delta Y positive or negative? It's negatory because it's downward. Uh, negative times negative? Positive. So we should get a positive number here. Okay, go ahead and figure that out. Take a minute, and I'll drink some Gatorade up here. Did you answer that last question?
Number three? No, I can't. Okay. Yeah, you should be all right. Parking on this campus is a true menace. A menace to society. Great. I love seeing what you guys are doing. Yeah, and just type in your answer carefully. Tomorrow from 9 until noon, uh, office hours right next door in the Physical Sciences Building, room 158. And your homework tonight, homework 12, hopefully by supper time, if not sooner. We could talk about during office hours tomorrow, 9 o'clock till noon, PSB 158. Okay, one minute. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, you guys, move it. Okay. All right, that's about right. One seventy four. Okay, let me see your answers here. Donna, Donna, Donna. 109.4 is correct. Raise your hand if you got 109.4. Sweet. All right, now I. L oh, oh, just like the morning class. There's a bunch of guys at negative 109.4, and that would be wrong on the exam. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Although I might give you partial credit for that. You forgot the minus signs. Uh, and what is this? 107.1071.8. What is that? 1071.8. I don't even know what that is. 176. Anyways, 109.4 is correct. Uh, on this one so let's go through our spec sheet again uh, let's just check off what we got all right we got a weight force negative 6.076 check uh, we have the work for an 18 meter drop 109.4 to the nearest tenth of a joule and it's dropping so it's gaining speed if delta Y were positive, that would signify you're going up. And in that case, your, your displacement is upward. Your force is downward, anti-parallel, negative change in the kinetic energy. In other words, you lose speed. You lose kinetic energy if you're on the way up. But this one is on the way down, and so 109.4. So the corresponding change in the kinetic energy, of course, is the same as the work. That is the definition of work. 
And the formula for computing the work is uh, F parallel times delta Y in this case. Now a couple questions to think over and we're going to do some more clicking about these questions. Uh, and we're going to do some homework about actually this first question. Uh, could you figure out the change in the speed? And if, in other words, go ahead and jot this down. If I tell you that the change in the kinetic energy is 100 joules, you know, for a nice round number, 100 joules of delta Ke, can that, can you use that to figure out the change in the speed? I mean, it's one half mv squared. It's a, it's delta of one half mv squared. Now, homework tonight, you'll have some problems fooling around with that. The second question here is: the basketball gains kinetic energy as it goes down. So does something else lose energy? You know, because the the two skateboarders, you know, they exchanged momenta. So if the if the if gravity is giving, or if the kinetic energy is increasing, is some other form of energy decreasing? Hit your refresh key, and let's take another question. So this is question five for today. And this one, I want you to think about it very carefully. It's basically that uh, previous question. Um, what loses energy? as the basketball gains kinetic energy. Now there's a zillion different ways to answer. Talk it over with your neighbors for a minute, a couple minutes, and type in an answer. And just type it in with one or two words. No codes, just the straight words. So what do you think? What are you typing in? I see people scratching their heads. Talk to your neighbor. you have a purple clicker hmm? that's actually smart because then it, you can distinguish you can always distinguish yours and I noticed that you can't write with a sharpie on these it'll rub right off it doesn't it doesn't stay on I hear clicking, clicking, clicking. Very good. Clicking, clicking, clicking. I see someone in the back eating their lunch. Nice. Did you bring enough to share with your, your, your neighbor there with a broken leg? And he's in pain? And you don't even have a single Cheeto for him? Come on. Have a heart, no? Oh, man. I remember that. And you have some... Man. Well, I sat up here drinking Gatorade, so I guess I shouldn't talk. All right, one minute. Don't write a novel, just write one or two words. Just think what you want. 
And everybody's going to get correct on this because it's kind of like a survey question. You know, the previous question you had to get it right. But this one, everybody will get one point. Malara, you ready to do some calculating? All right. You're the calcul you're the queen of calculation over there. Every day I check you out. Make sure you're ready. From the very first day. La da da di. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. 179 answers. And as with the morning class, there's a bunch of cheaters in here that already know the answer. Let me go down the list here a little bit. We'll show. I'll show you some of your answers here. Hold on a second. Uh, all right, here. A bunch of you voted for gravity. Uh, nothing. What? Oh, maybe I'll. You know, maybe I should go through and look. You know, I had somebody write in one time. Something really bad. Gravity. Now, look at that weight force. Gravity's not bad. You know, gravity, I guess you could, or the gravitational system. You know, of one earth and one basketball, you know. Maybe you could say it's losing energy. Uh, weight force, no go. Now, the, if you if you voted for Wade Force, if you didn't, uh, write down what I'm about to say. Wade Force is incorrect because a uh, force is a property of an object, but it is not something that can have other properties. So a force can't have a mass. A force can't have an energy. A, for a force is a force. A book could have an energy or a force. Uh, you know, an M&M &M could have some energy. Does have some. Food energy. Uh, you know, objects can have energies, and for but not a force. Also, even if a force did have some, it's not changing. The force... The gravitational force of Earth, the weight force, is just good old MG from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. So that's not so good. Now, hit your, um, let's talk about one more. Air. Ooh. I've never seen, I'm going to look at these tonight. Air. That's Aristotle talking. Aristotle thought that air was, you know, like for something going through the air, a projectile that the air kind of came in behind it and kept it moving. So that's Aristotle talking there. Momentum, potential. Ooh, bunch of other answers there. Well, let's keep. Let me get this back over here. Hit your refresh key. We're not done. We're not even close to being done. Well, that's what we're talking about right now. <laughs> what, the answer is everything that we're talking about right now. In other words, it's the, it's the topic of everything that we're doing right now. What is it that loses energy? What does it mean to lose energy when kinetic energy increases? Now, water balloons are not the answer. But we're going to talk about water balloons. Next question, number six for today. Read it carefully. Calvin and Hobbes up in the tree.
30 seconds. If you think it should be obvious, Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh huh. Uh, my wonderful students, I see that 31 students in here voted for 19.6 newton meters. That is wrong. Let me ask you this. You're seated five meters up in a tree. You're holding onto a water balloon. The water balloon is at rest. At rest means V equals... Zero. So kinetic energy equals. And that is the answer to that one. All right. Now, just when you thought it was safe, wait, there's still more. Question number seven. How much work will gravity do? to the water balloon on the way back to the ground. So in the five meters that it drops just before impact. Deborah. What's the spider report over there today? All clear? Okay, good. Don't want any more of those. You know, I saw the spider crawl, crawl across the, 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 the tile floor in my family room, and all of a sudden, all these little tiny ones jumped off of it. It was baby spiders. They looked like little dots. You want to see, I, I took a picture of it. You want me to bring it to class and give it, you know, so you can, so you can see it, you know. I'm just kidding. I didn't take a picture. But I did see it. I thought, what the heck is that? And it, it must have been little baby spiders because they could hardly walk. They all got smushed. I smushed them. Okay, 30 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, ooh, we got some splaining to do here. Uh, there's a little bit of a distribution of answers here. Uh, the correct answer is 19.6. Um, and that's because it's now, it's not an 18 meter drop, it's a five meter drop. So you have the weight force times n minus five meters and that works out to 19.6 joules. And I see some people here that voted for 3.92 Newtons uh, 31% of the class, 54 people. Uh, no, be very careful with that. Read very carefully. If I ask you a question about work, the answer, it, matter of fact, everybody, write this down. This is kind of a, this is kind of a vocabulary comment. If the question asks for an answer about work, that means you should look for newtons. Excuse me. It, it means you should look for joules. 
not newtons. Newton meters are the same as a joule. So Mr. Serrano, kilogram meter squared per second squared is the same as a joule. So kilogram meter per second, no, that's, a, that's momentum. So if you're looking for work, if, your answer, if the question is about work, the answer's got to be in joules, newton meter, or kilogram meter squared per second squared, one of those three. Do not let me catch you napping. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I'm not I was look I was I was looking at you but I could be anybody. Don't anybody let me catch you napping. Question. What loses energy? What was the answer? What did I say? It's everything we're talking about. Potential energy. And that's the answer. The thing that is diminished as kinetic energy increases is potential energy. And it is a huge tool for a physicist. Now, the generic formula for gravitational potential energy at the surface of Earth is just mg delta y. And in this formula, students, yes, you must use a negative 9.8. And therefore, um, when delta Y is positive, excuse me, you must use 9.8, positive 9.8 in this formula. And that way, when delta Y is positive, increasing altitude, the potential energy, you're, and if you think about it, if delta Y is positive, you're losing kinetic, so you want to have a higher potential energy number. Okay? And the sum of these two, this is the conservation now, the sum of these two numbers, are always they always add up to the same. So if you lose some kinetic, it's because you've gained some potential energy. Similarly, when you lose altitude, delta Y is negatory. The, kinetic, the potential energy decreases. Okay, you're, And so uh, one way to think about it is that for every meter... Uh, of altitude that you lose, you gain some uh, kinetic energy and vice versa. So for every kilogram of mass of an object, and for every uh, meter of altitude, the gravitational potential energy is defined. And for that reason, we call it the energy of position. And I, I don't know, I, I didn't really comb through all the answers to that question that you were asking about, you know. Um, but this is the answer, and you, it's, it's hard to s express it in one word. But the thing that loses potential energy it really is the gravitational system. And it loses potential energy as, it, as the system gains kinetic energy. Now, there's a lot of calculus behind that sentence, the energy of position, a huge amount of calculus. And we're not supposed to do any calculus in this class, uh, which is all right. But just knowing the concept, energy of position, can tell you a lot. Matter of fact, it's the energy of distance. It really usually boils down to a distance. Now, I want to... Um, Reinforce one thing. Every joule of kinetic energy that you gain on the way down corresponds to losing a joule of potential energy. So that when you're at the top of your, you know, if you're at the top uh, shelf 
uh, in the library, and the book is at rest up there, it has a, a bunch of potential energy, but it's not moving. But as soon as you, you know, tip it off the edge of the bookshelf, down it goes, and it acquires all that potential energy transformed into kinetic energy. Okay, so the storage of energy is up there. It's ready to be turned into kinetic energy as soon as you shove it off the shelf. All right. Now, I have another high-altitude system I want to show you about, and that is this uh, space shuttle reentry. We're going to work this problem out. And so definitely, uh, everybody, you want to have your calculator out. Plus, you want to be able to handle scientific notation because we're going to be handling some big, big, big numbers here. Now, this is a great, great photo. It's, an inf it's a false color infrared photo taken by, I don't know, NASA or the Air Force from an aircraft. Now, if you look down here at the bottom, it says distance from aircraft, 28.2 nm. That's 28.2 nautical miles. So NASA, when they're talking about the distance of a spacecraft from something, they always measure it like they're in the Navy. So, in other words, nautical miles. I don't know why they do that, but that's what they do. Altitude, 160,900 feet. Speed, Mach 9.1. They're really mo motating. Matter of fact, 9.1 Mach is about 7,000 miles per hour. Go ahead and jot that down. 160,900 feet, that's about 50 kilometers. So we're going to work this MG Delta Y business, uh, Valeria, for the space shuttle, the space transport system, uh, from an initial speed of 7,000 miles per hour at a height, an altitude of 50,000 uh, meters, 50 kilometers. All right. And it's, you know, space shuttle, boy, what a, it's in retirement now. I was really sad when they put it into retirement because it did a lot of fantastic stuff. And I don't think they'll ever bring them out of retirement because they pretty much decommissioned them. But anyway, so here we go. Reentry, altitude of 50,000 meters 50 kilometers now we're we're heading for kennedy space center you know, that big runway they got out there so it's basically at an altitude of zero sea level okay and the reentry attitude i've got it uh drawn out here uh that's basically that you know they kind of do a belly flop into the atmosphere so that they increase the amount of air resistance friction with the atmosphere and burn off all those joules of kinetic and potential energy that they've got at 50,000 meters uh, down to almost zero at Kennedy Space Center. They have to have a little bit left. So let's get the specs. Mass of the STS, mm, about 100 metric tons. So that's 100,000 kilograms. Now, landing speed, we can't, you know, burn off all the kinetic energy. So we want it to have a little bit. 250 miles an hour is the landing speed for that uh, Kennedy uh, Space Center landing strip. And that I think that's pretty hot. Anybody in here fly airplanes? Private airplanes? Usually there's a pilot or two. I guess not. Uh, from what I understand, most aircraft land at about 100 miles an hour. You know, except for the little teeny, tiny aircraft. But this, so this is pretty high. But we'll we'll call it 100 meters per second for a round number. 100 meters per second would be a little bit faster than that. So, so for our calculations, we'll we'll call it 100 meters per second landing speed. So that that means it's going to have a little bit of one half mv squared when it hits the runway. And then you hit the brakes, and you pop the chutes, and you just roll it out. And eventually you come to a stop. And then you have zero kinetic energy. And then the astronauts get out and all that stuff. All right. So from this altitude, um, a rough time to descend to Kennedy and land is about 12 minutes. And that is about 720 seconds. So from 50,000 
meters altitude back down. So this is basically from somewhere over California down to, you know, off the coast of California, down to Kennedy, the way they usually come in. You know, they start, they start doing these big S-turns to bleed off speed when they're deorbiting over the Indian Ocean. And then across the Pacific, they do two or three of these turns, and by the time to, to bleed off speed, you know, at like Mach 23 or whatever it is, and then by the time they get to the coast of California, it's more like this, you know, somewhere out in the Pacific off the coast. So here's our question, number one, how much energy is dissipated? So what we're going to figure out is, you know, knowing its altitude, we can figure out MGH for the gravitational potential energy. we got to burn all that off. And we, we know its speed up there. It's Mach 9.1. So we can figure out its kinetic energy up there. And then we know the kinetic energy when it lands. Um, and the potential energy when it lands is zero because it's down at sea level. And so um, we're going to figure that out. And the other thing we're going to do is figure out how quickly it's dissipated. Okay, so all that energy, kinetic and potential, has to be blasted out into the atmosphere as heat, heated up air, plasma, uh, or a little bit of absorbed by the uh, airframe of the space shuttle. And those people that were killed on the What's the one that was, this is when you guys were little shrimpy kids, back in 2002. It was uh, Columbia, right? No, Challenger was back in 86. You guys weren't even a gleam in the eye of your parents, most of you, in 86 or 87. I remember that. Anyways, they dissipate a huge amount of heat. And that's why, you know, the one that in 2002 that was lost... God help them. Anyways, let's work this out. Dynamical state at 50 uh, kilometers altitude. So up here we've got a lot of KE because it's on orbit, or it's coming off of orbit. It still has speed. And it's got a lot of GPE because it's still, you know, if you had a rock up there just at 50 kilometers and let it drop straight down, it would really be whipping by the time it got down to, the, you know, down to uh, Kennedy Space Center. So it's up there. Uh, mass is 10,000, uh, kilo, 100,000 kilograms. Uh, the velocity up there, okay, Mach 9.1 is about 3,130 meters per second. So that's our V1, okay? When we start our clocks, our 12 minute clock down at Kennedy Space Center, that's our starting speed, our VI. Uh, delta Y is going to be 50,000 meters, and it's actually going to be negative 50,000. You can put a minus sign in there if you want. And uh, let's figure out kinetic energy first. One, a good old one-half mv squared. The easiest of the lot. And then we're going to do GPE. And then we're going to combine those to get the total energy. And this is the number that's conserved, the total energy. Because kinetic energy can change, gravitational potential energy can change, uh, but the total, the sum of the two, is always the same. And this is the amount of energy that has to be dissipated almost to zero. We want a little bit for when it hits the runway. All right. And there's various braking methods that they use. You know, they're trading altitude for kinetic energy, and a lot of heat energy has to be dissipated. So they're dissipating a lot of it through heat, heating up the atmosphere, and then aerodynamic braking, different methods to do that as well. Um, so here we go, 1 half mv squared, Ke1. Uh, one half, and then the mass of 100,000 kilograms, and then the speed, V1, quantity squared, 3130 meters per second, quantity squared. And Miss Caitlin, 3130, go ahead and verify me on your calculators if you have your calculator handy. 3130 quantity squared is 9,796,900. 
and then don't forget that you have this uh, meter squared per second squared inside the parentheses now. All right. So when you square the parentheses, you have to square everything that's inside the parentheses. All right. And now you just multiply it out, and it might force your calculator into a scientific notation. 489.8 times 10 to the 9. You might come with 4.898 times 10 to the 11. That would be equivalent in scientific notation. I'm going to stay in units of 10 to the 9 kilogram meter squared per second. Uh-oh. Is that right? Kilogram meter squared per second squared? For an energy? Don't let me catch you napping now. Did I? Am I is this right? Kilogram meter squared per second squared for an energy? No? Yes? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's a jewel. Okay. And this is and this is 10 to the 9. That's a billion with a B. B for Bravo. So we got a lot of joules there. All right. So kinetic energy, 490 billion up here. Uh, next, GPE. Let's figure this out. This one's MGY, MG delta Y, MGH. And delta Y is 50,000 kilometers. Or excuse me. 50 kilometers, 50,000 regular meters. So here's your calculation, 100,000 mass, 100,000 kilograms. Hmm? Yeah, it, it's just, we're just computing a positive number here. But the, the negative signs. So that you know, this is a this is what you this is the amount of work it takes to get up to this altitude. Think of it that way. Um, okay, 9.8 meters per second squared. That's pretty close to what they have uh, at that altitude. And then the altitude itself, 50,000 meters. And when you do that all out, you can get a 10 to the 9 out of this one too. So this is in the billions of joules. And it works out to 49 times 10 to the 9 joules. So your GPE, 49 billion joules. And we've got a lot of joulage, a lot of energy. So the total energy E, uh, which is our objective here, is 539 billion joules. And the symbol for total energy is usually a capital E, although sometimes you see other letters. Usually it's capital E for energy. Now the kinetic energy at landing, 100 meters per second landing speed, is half a billion joules. Now here's your calculation for it. Okay. Um, here's the landing speed, 100 meters per second quantity squared and then multiply it out you get 0 0.5 times 10 to the 9 kilogram meter squared per second squared all right and so that's that's half a billion so you've got to burn off basically 538.5 billion joules of energy into the air into the atmosphere or into the airframe of the uh, and a limited amount of energy can go into the airframe so that's they have to design all this stuff really carefully because if they make it out of something you know if you make it out of something that's not going to survive re-entry you know it's, it's a disaster the thing will melt so for instance um, if you make it out of like regular titanium or something it'll melt it just will not they have these big spy planes, the XR-71, that's now retired, they say, uh, the Blackbird. And it would go so fast that the leading edges of the wings would uh, uh, 
be red hot. And I remember seeing it one time when I was in Montana. Uh, I was out watching August 12th or so for the for the Perseid meteor shower, and I saw this this V-shaped thing way high up, and it was dull, kind of a dull red, and it was flying down to the southeast. And I thought, oh, that's a flock of geese up there. And it, it, they're so high up that they're catching the sun, you know, because it was it was early morning, it was before sunrise, about two three a.m. I thought, oh, they're just getting this. They're so far. But then I thought, no, that can't be right because they're really going fast. But by that time, you know, it passed when I thought that. But then, uh, you know, an hour later, I'm I'm looking at all the meteors coming across, and I saw it coming back from almost the same direction. And I thought, what the? That's got to be a UFO. So then I was talking to my buddies, and they said, no, that's probably the SR, the SR-71 Blackbird. That, and, and what you were seeing is those red hot leading edges. That that's how fast they go when they when they need to. Anyway, so space shuttle even more energy has to be dissipated. So to dissipate this energy, now th this quantity delta E over delta T is called the power, and we use symbol capital P for this. And this is how much we have to burn off in 12 minutes, 720 seconds, 538. 0.5 divided by 720, and that's billion joules per second. So that works out to 0 0.748 billion joules per second. And just as a side note, a power in general is the rate of production, use, or dissipation of energy in a physical system. So, for instance, your toaster at home that's used for making toast, uh, it gets red hot and it's dissipating energy as heat and light. You know, it has those special filaments, those little curly Q filaments, and they gener a lot, generate a lot of heat and they toast your bread. Uh, same thing with your hair dryer. If you have a hair dryer, that's 1800 watts of hair dryer. You know, they pull a lot of wattage. Uh, toaster, not so much. Anyways, the fancy name for 1.0 joule per second in the metric system is a watt. Okay, hair dryer, 1,200 watts, 1,800 watts, something like that, 1,500 watts. Toaster, I don't know. You know so that, now, a microwave oven might be a similar number, you know, 2,000 watts of power. And what that means is that's the amount of joules per second going into the microwaves in the oven. Okay, so they're putting a lot of energy into microwaves. Those things are extremely powerful you got to be really careful with them so the dissipation rate is 0 0.748 billion watts and that my wonderful students is also known as a gigawatt so if somebody ever asks you about 1.21 gigawatts now you have the basic concept all right now so the so in summary the space shuttle has to dissipate energy at the rate of about um, 0 0.748 billion watts 0 0.748 billion joules per second uh, so you might you know ask yourself well uh, what exactly is a gigawatt and so here's a picture of one of the biggest power generators in the United States, Grand Coulee Dam. It has um, a water column 550 feet tall. And it's real huge. I mean, you can't even see, I guess you can maybe see little teeny cars in that picture. I've actually been to Grand Coulee Dam. It's out in Washington State on the Columbia River. And what you're looking at is the Columbia River above and below the dam. And it puts out, for the Pacific Northwest, about 6.809 gigawatts. That's what it's rated for when it's working um, normal power. You know, sometimes they work it at half power, depending on the demand and stuff like that. Uh, but that's a gigawatt. That's, that's a 6.809. So the space shuttle has to 
has to dissipate a little bit more than a tenth of what this thing produces. So it's an enormous amount of energy per second that the space shuttle has to basically ditch before it can land safely. You guys feel like dismissing early? All right. We'll dismiss early. Homework 12, ready by supper time tonight, hopefully, if not sooner. You're dismissed.